It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Edward P. Morgan of the CBS television news staff, and Mr. Thomas J. Hamilton, United Nations correspondent for the New York Times. Our distinguished guest for this evening is His Excellency Abba Eban, ambassador from Israel to the United States. Mr. Eban, we know, of course, that you are leading the Israeli embassy in Washington, as well as being head of the Israeli delegation to the United Nations, and therefore Mr. Hamilton and I are going to feel free to ask you a lot of bold, broad questions about the Middle East. But it won't do us any good unless we really know what we're talking about, and I suspect that a lot of us has, have forgotten a lot of salient facts about Israel. The population, for instance, the size of the country, the spirit of the people, uh, the question of immigration. Will you tell us a little bit about that in the beginning, and then we can get on to the other big questions? Well, you've asked a very broad question. I, some of your queries I can answer very specifically. We're a country of 8,000 square miles in area. That's almost exactly the size of the state of New Jersey in the United States. And we're surrounded by an Arab world which covers a continental expanse almost as great as the whole of the United States. In that area of 8,000 square miles, we now have a population of some 1,700,000. That is an increase of over a million as against the population of our country at the time when its independence was declared, and the greater part of that increase is due to mass immigration which took place between the years 1950 to 1952. As for the spirit of the people, that's much less easily measured by statistics, but uh, it's the spirit of a people in the stage of its revolution, in the formative years of its fight for independence, a pioneering era such as happens only once in the life of the country. It's the era of our founding fathers, and we have all the hardships, the adversities, and the excitements which uh, belong to a people in that revolutionary period of its national life. Now what about the uh, Arab refugees, Mr. Eban? I believe there are about 800,000 Arabs who formerly lived in the territory now controlled by Israel who fled abroad uh, to the neighboring Arab countries during the Civil War. Now that that's, of course, coming up in the Assembly soon. Can you tell us what's going to happen to them? Yes, that question is uh, perpetually before the General Assembly, and it really is the most acute uh, symptom of crisis in the Middle East. In the first place, it should be understood that the Arab refugee problem is a consequence of a war, a war that was launched by the Arab states in an attempt to extinguish Israel's existence by armed force. Uh, the effort to overthrow Israel's independence failed, but in the course, in the course of that uh, failure, the Arab governments did create this very acute humanitarian um, condition. With regard to a solution, it is quite clear to us that the Arab governments which caused that problem uh, possess the full capacity to solve it. That is to say, they possess the land resources, they possess the water, uh, they possess the financial means, and they possess those conditions of cultural kinship and linguistic affinity with the refugee population, such as would enable their swift integration into the Arab um, lands. I'd like to say that we speak here from some experience uh, Israel has, as I have said, within the space of a few years, absorbed into its midst some 750,000 destitute refugees, 300,000 of them being Jews from Arab countries. Now, if our country, with its 8,000 square miles and its meager resources of land and water, could find homes for 750,000 homeless, destitute, wandering refugees, how much more easily could the Arab countries, with their vast area, their enormous resources and their unlimited expanse find homes for an equal number of their own kinsmen if only the same will existed and the same impulses of kinship 
asserted themselves. Mr. Therefore, Ambassador, I don't think that it's an objectively difficult problem. Mr. Ambassador, it, rightly or wrongly, a lot of people seem to think that uh, a mistake of some kind was made uh, by the Israelis uh, in the Arab refugee problem in demanding that they all leave. Uh, some of them left of their own volition, uh, some of them apparently did not. Uh, th there were those who were well integrated with the country, who had no particular antipathy, supposedly, to the, to the Israeli, uh, and that they might, other things being equal, come back. W what would you comment about that, sir? Well, as regards the historical part of your question, there was certainly no policy on our part that they should leave. They left as an inevitable result of the war that was forced upon them and upon us, caught up in a hopeless torment between their own invading kinsmen and their own Jewish neighbors. In that untenable uh, situation, amidst the fear and the panic of war, they fled into the shelter of Arab countries. But the m most important thing, as I've said and as you've indicated, is not to linger upon past responsibility, but to uh, dwell upon the question of future solution. In that respect, there is no doubt at all that the Arab countries possess the capacity of integrating a huge Arab population, and that the State of Israel quite noticeably lacks those conditions. We lack the economic conditions, we lack the spiritual conditions, because Israel is the only country in the Middle East in which an Arab refugee would not be at home, the only non-Arab country in language, in outlook, in aspiration, and in national sentiment. And above all, we lack the elementary security conditions for absorbing a large and, I'm afraid, potentially hostile population into our midst so that anybody who cares for the stability of our area and for the ultimate benefit of the refugees themselves uh, should sponsor a solution for his integration into the kinship and the into the kinship and fraternity of those Arab societies which exist so plentifully in our area and I think that uh, the greater part of international opinion in the Western world uh, favors a solution along those lines. But of course the Arabs don't. The, Arab, the neighboring Arab states say they will not agree to it. No, the neighboring Arab uh, states apparently are, are more interested in preserving the political pressures inherent in the lack of refugee integration. Which brings up a very delicate point, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I, I think you uh, told us as we came onto the program that the aggregate area of the Arab states was something equivalent to the United States, whereas the, as you said uh, when we got on the air, uh, that the size of Israel was about the size of New Jersey. Now, how realistic is the existence of Israel under those conditions? Is it something that, that can go on and burgeon, or is it simply a thorn in the flesh of, of Middle Eastern politics? Well, we are a very small country, and our smallness is, I think, a conclusive answer to those who suggest that we should be made still smaller, or that we should um, uh, acknowledge an obligation to give up territory to countries hundreds of times the size of Israel and hundreds of times as rich as Israel in every um, attribute of material and territorial strength. On the other hand, we don't feel that our smallness forbids us from existing. We are not the smallest nation on earth, either in population uh, or in uh, territory. We rely upon an intensive development of our agriculture and upon the institution of, um, a of industrial expansion in order to uh, provide uh, homes on our soil for a population greater than that which exists. In Roman times, the, uh, the country of Judea was said to have a population of some four million. <coughs> that was a time before scientific development enabled intensive agriculture to uh, be developed uh, and uh, before the age of the Industrial Revolution. So that I think we could anticipate a growth to two, three, perhaps up to four million people without um, uh, the um, pressure of the population. Mr. Ambassador, our economy down. people, uh, pundits and others, uh, keep talking about a power vacuum in the Middle mm. East. Where does Israel figure in this, and, and is that a, a fair statement? Well, I always wonder what, all, what, what, what pundits mean by the abstruse phraseology which they use. I presume that they mean that um, the Middle East is uh, what has been called an uncommitted area, that is to say, there is no certainty where it would stand in the event of a world conflict. Uh, that is, of course, a true description of the Middle East. It has not attached itself to any world cause. As regards Israel, we are dedicated almost alone in our region 
uh, to parliamentary democracy and we would uh, defend our institutions and our territory against any attack and uh, our uh, cause is the cause of those who would resist aggression and who would maintain free institutions against attack or subversion if they should ever come. But the Middle East as a whole has not determined itself spiritually um, and therefore its course of action in the event of an emergency uh, is very much a matter for concern. Of course there's one, one parallel, Mr. Eben, that a lot of people have mentioned in connection with Korea that in Palestine you've, you've been operating under the armistice agreements between Israel and the Arab states for some four years or more, and you haven't had a peace treaty. In Korea, a lot of people are, are, are assuming that there won't be a peace treaty and that, that we'll have to operate in Korea mm. just on the basis of, of an armistice. How does it feel to, <coughs> to, oper to have your affairs with the Arab states controlled solely by an armistice with no with no peace treaty and with the Arab boycott of Israeli commerce. Can you tell well, us in a couple yes. of words an answer to a complicated question? It's a complicated question, but it's a very interesting parallel. Uh, we have lived for five years on the basis of uh, general armistice agreements with our neighboring states. We hoped and we still hope that there would be a swift transition from armistice to peace, but uh, since the Arab states refused to negotiate agreements with us, we've had to make the best of these provisional armistice agreements. All I can say is that we have proved that it is a possible thing, if not a very desirable thing, to live in an intermediate stage, which is neither complete peace nor complete war. Thank and uh, it's at least a better position than living in a state of war. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Edward P. Morgan of the CBS Television News Staff and Mr. Thomas J. Hamilton, United Nations Correspondent for the New York Times. Our distinguished guest was His Excellency Abba Eban, Ambassador from Israel to the United States. You always know that a fine watch such as Longines actually improves with use. Yes, long years after an inferior watch has virtually worn out and has been discarded, a Longines watch continues to be an accurate and a dependable timepiece. So may I suggest that when you're planning the purchase of a very fine watch, first compare the facts about Longines with the facts you have about other watches you may know. Now the facts reveal that Longines is one of the very finest of the world's watches. In side-by-side -side comparison with the best watches of the world, Longines is the only watch to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy, and a position of preference in sports, aviation, and in science. Now, the Longines watch of today is made with the skill and the experience of almost a century of fine watchmaking. It's endowed with those qualities of greater accuracy and longer life for which Longines watches are world-renowned. And yet, you may buy and own, or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Tuesday nights, see it now on the CBS television network.